Uh, I want to share with you a, a true story uh, here this morning. This is a, a true story that's told in uh, Christopher Ashe's little book called Zeal Without Burnout. And it's the story of a man named Roy. Uh, here's some of what Roy writes. Monday, July 2nd, 2012, is burned on my memory. I climbed on board a crowded tube train that morning to go to my office, but I was not looking forward to work. I had a difficult meeting with a colleague first thing that morning, and I had been worried about it all weekend. I picked up a free paper and started to read, but as the train got closer to my destination, I felt a crushing, agonizing weight on my chest. I'm having a heart attack, I thought, and staggered to the door at the next station. I collapsed on the platform, bewildered, with my hand on my chest. I gasped, somebody help, and then lost consciousness. I spent the next 24 hours at the hospital where the surprising verdict was that there was absolutely nothing wrong with my heart. I had suffered an extreme panic attack. But when I returned home, not only could I not face work, I simply could not face people. I didn't want to have anything to do with anybody. I shut down from life completely. Colleagues who were not aware it was wrong joked that I had tied my illness to perfection so I could watch the Olympics. Nothing could be further from the truth. I sat in a chair day after day with the TV switched on, but I was oblivious to anything that was happening on the screen in front of me. Nothing registered. How had I arrived at this point? What I suffered that morning and what followed had been building for a long time. Uh, again, that's a true story uh, about a man who lives in London uh, named Roy. Now, I'll share a little bit more of his uh, story with you uh, later on, uh, but I wonder if you can identify with Roy in any way. Uh, you, ever, you ever felt like everything was just sort of closing in on you? Uh, you, ever, you ever been on the verge of sort of feeling burnt out, uh, broken down, uh, with no help, nowhere to go? Or maybe the situation hasn't been uh, quite that bad. Do you ever just feel tired? Do you ever feel weary? Do you ever feel fed up? Tired of a situation? Tired of people? Well, as we uh, are continuing here with Psalm 119, uh, we once again uh, come to this psalmist who's written this, this long psalm. And, and the section that we come here today, it's a, it's a section that helps us to better understand some of the difficulties that the, that the psalmist himself is, is walking through. Uh, remember that Psalm 119, it's the longest extended prayer that we have in the Bible. Uh, beginning at verse 4 all the way through verse 176, the author of the psalm is talking to God and he's asking God for his help. Uh, remember, this is a man who, uh, he's been shaped by the word of God, he's been shaped by the Bible, and as a result, he, he now talks to God about what God has revealed in the Bible, and he does so particularly as it relates to the struggles that he's walking through in his life. Because this man is living in a tension that we all know. It's the tension of what we saw last week, uh, that God's way is the blessed way. Uh, that God's word promises happiness and, and life to those who obey his word. And yet, there's the tension of that promise as it's combined with the reality of experiencing the sin and suffering that we so often do in this world. And so as we turn our attention to, to these two stanzas of Psalm 119, uh, stanzas 3 and 4 that we're looking at here today, it's verses 17 to 32, uh, we're going to learn just a little bit more about who this man is, uh, what some of his struggles are, and then most importantly, how it is that he responds to God's word in the midst of his struggles. And so friends, I, I pray that this will be useful for us this morning as uh, we too seek to follow the, the Lord Jesus and to do so not just when life is going well, not just when life is easy, uh, but also when it's very difficult and we're walking through hard times. Uh, hence the title for today's sermon uh, wondrous things for the weary. Uh, the first thing we should note this morning is that this is a man who belongs to God. According to his own self-identification, the author of this psalm is a servant of God and a sojourner in this world. Uh, he begins there in verse 17 by identifying himself in this very way. Uh, Deal bountifully with your servant. Then in verse 21, he uh, contrasts himself with those who aren't servants of God, as he speaks about the insolent, accursed ones who wander from your commandments. 
Uh, this is clearly in contrast with, with who he understands himself to be. Thus, verse 23. Even though princes sit plotting against me, your servant, referring to himself, will meditate on your statutes. So this is a man who freely belongs to God. If you were to ask him who he's living his life for, this is a man who's open about his allegiance to God. Uh, he's not hiding in the shadows somewhere. He's not, a, not afraid to be associated with the things of the Lord. Rather, he's very transparent about the fact that he's committed to God. And therefore, he also describes himself as being a sojourner on the earth. Verse 19, I am a sojourner on the earth. Hide not your commandments from me. In other words, this man recognizes that he's an alien and a stranger in this world. Uh, why? Because this world isn't his home. Uh, he's only temporarily visiting. He's, he's passing through as a pilgrim. His, his true home is with God, not this world. And thus again, this is a man who belongs to God. And that's fundamental to his identity. But secondly, this morning, we must also note that this is a man who's weary. He's weary. Now, remember, we said a couple of weeks ago that the author of this psalm tends to, uh, or seems to have written it in such a way that he intends for each of the stanzas to be connected in pairs. And so last week, we saw that stanzas one and two are paired together, both thematically and structurally. And the same is true here today with stanzas three and four. And one of the links between these two stanzas is the opening verse of each. Now, each stanza opens with a cry for life. Uh, verse 17, deal bountifully with your servant that I may live and keep your word. Verse 25, my soul clings to the dust. Give me life according to your word. And so this is a man, he's crying out to God because he wants to live. God, give me life, give me, give me physical life, give me spiritual life. I mean, clearly this man thinks that death is a possibility. He's worn out, he's run down, he's weary. Now, perhaps he's weary in part because it's not easy to be a sojourner day in and day out. You know, it's not easy to constantly feel like you don't belong in a place. Uh, this is a man who loves God's word so much so that he pants after it. Uh, so much so that he's written this whole love poem for it, and yet he lives among people who, verse 21, wander from the commandments of God. Reminds me of what Jesus said in John 15. Uh, Jesus said in John 15, if you were of the world, the world would love you as its own, but because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. It's interesting how Jesus phrases that. I'm the master, says Jesus. You are the servants. And as my servants, therefore, what he's essentially saying is you are sojourners in this world. Uh, the things that shape your mind and shape your thinking and the things that shape your heart and your affections, those aren't the same things that shape the thinking and the affections of this world. And so you see, that's what this man here is experiencing. He's out of place. He's not home. He's tired. He's growing weary. This man also seems to be growing weary because of the way that others are treating him. So in verse 22, he asks for God to take away the scorn and contempt that he's receiving. At verse 23, he refers to the fact that princes sit plotting against him. And, and notice, though, this is critical. The reason he's being mistreated is because, as he says here, I have kept your testimonies. Take away the scorn and contempt for me. Uh, why am I receiving that? For I have kept your testimonies. So he's not being slandered or abused for any old reason. He's, he's actually trying to live for God. And it's, it's precisely because he's trying to follow the Lord that he's being abused. They're treating him like he's worthless, like he's a nuisance to this world. And so they're, they're pouring out contempt on him. And so he paints this picture in verse 23 uh, of himself uh, sitting there and meditating on God's word while those in authority are sitting and meditating, but they're not sitting and meditating on God's word. They're sitting and meditating on ways that they can do harm to him. I'm meditating on your word, God. I'm sitting here meditating on it. They're over there sitting and meditating on ways they can do me harm. In fact, this man has come to a place of such weariness. Look again at the way he describes himself in verse 25. My soul clings to the dust. This is a man who's brought so low, he's been, been so humiliated in his life that he's become one with the dust. 
And so you can see now why he cries out to God for life. Uh, I'm in the dust. My life is passing from me. I've become nothing. And, and then to add to his weariness here is just an overwhelming sorrow that he now feels. Look at verse 28. My soul melts away for sorrow. Uh, you may know the name uh, William Cooper. Uh, Cooper was an old Christian saint who uh, wrote many wonderful hymns. In fact, Kyle, I was thinking we should do some William Cooper hymns as we work through this series. There's some really good ones that'll fit in here. But Cooper was also someone who uh, struggled with depression. And at one point, he simply wrote, where's the blessedness I once knew? Where's my happiness in the Lord? And that's what this man here in this, this is expressing here in this, this stanza, in this psalm. The, if you remember, the first two stanzas, right, they're all about how a young man can set his life on a trajectory of following God and thus knowing the blessings of God. And yet here he is saying now in these two stanzas, where's that blessedness I once knew? My soul is melting away for sorrow. Alienation, loneliness, rejection, scorn. A dryness of soul, this man is weary. Now, I won't ask you again if you can identify with any of this. That was kind of a dumb question, because of course you can. <laughs> right? If you're a human being, you know what it is to be weary. And if you're a Christian, you also know particularly what it is to, to be weary because you're a servant of God and because you're a sojourner in this world. And so the real question is, what do you do when you're weary? How do you respond to the weariness? You know, are, you, are you tempted to maybe run from God when you're weary? So God, I, don't want, I, can't, I can't do anything with you right now. I'm just, I got all this stuff I got to do. I, I can't read your word. I don't want your word. You run from his word. You run from his truth because you just feel so overwhelmed by everything else that's going on. God, I don't have time for that right now. Life is too crazy. Or do you do what the psalmist does here? which is not run from God's word, but cling to God's word. Right? His soul may be clinging to the dust, but notice verse 31, I cling to your testimonies, O Lord. My soul is clinging to the dust, but I'm also clinging to your word, O God. I'm, I'm not letting go of what you've spoken in your word, no matter what the world throws at me. In fact, in both instances here, when he cries out to God for life, he does so in relation to God's word. Verse 17, deal bountifully with your servant that I may live and keep your word. Verse 25, my soul clings to the dust. Give me life according to your word. In other words, this man would have easily understood exactly what Jesus meant when Jesus was being tempted in the wilderness by Satan. And after 40 days of weariness in the wilderness, Satan tempted him to turn stone into bread, to which Jesus replied, quoting Deuteronomy 8, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And similarly, this man knows that God's word is life, it's nourishment. And thus he's clinging to God's word. And so the next thing we should notice here this morning is what he asked God to do with the word in his life. And he prays at least four different things here. At first, he asks God to open his eyes. Verse 18, open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. Friends, I think that's probably one of the most uh, important verses, perhaps, uh, in this whole psalm. Uh, it's just such a, it's such a foundational request. I, I know that for some of you, like me, this is what you very uh, often pray uh, before you read the Bible. Right? You, you open up your Bible and you say, God, please show me wondrous things out of your word here today. Uh, every day, almost every day in my life, it, it sort of begins this way. God, thank you for a night of rest. Thank you for a new day. Thank you for your word. Now, please, will you show me wondrous things? as I read the Bible here this morning. It's a foundational request. So let's take some extra time this morning to reflect on verse 18 and the significance of this request. Because one of the things that this verse teaches us is that there are indeed wondrous things to be seen in the Bible. Uh, the psalmist here uses the word law, but remember, don't think of law too narrowly. 
Uh, we thought about this a few weeks ago. This word law simply means uh, authoritative instruction or teaching. And so really it's just another way of referring to all of God's written revelation. In other words, you could, you could rightly refer to the whole Bible as God's law. Uh, the Bible is God's authoritative teaching. And what verse 18 is telling us is that there are wonderful things to be seen in the Bible. That's the first thing this verse teaches us. A second thing is this. Verse 18 is also teaching us that if we're going to see the wondrous things in the Bible, then we need God to open our eyes so that we can do so. And the idea here is that there's a veil that needs to be removed. But listen, the veil, the veil isn't covering the Bible as if, as if God's word was dull or unclear. Uh, no, the, the idea here is that the veil is covering our eyes. Uh, the, the dullness, the, the lack of clarity is in us. And so we need God to remove the veil from our eyes so that we can see the wondrous things that are in his word. In fact, the same word uh, used here is used in the story of Balaam. Remember that story? It's the fun story of Balaam and the donkey, Numbers 22. Right, Balaam's going and doing something he shouldn't be going and doing in terms of the prophecy, and, uh, and, and, and his donkey's giving him a hard time. His donkey's not, not obeying his instruction. Donkey's sent off course by an angel standing in the road. Balaam gets upset, but the problem is Balaam doesn't see the angel. The donkey sees the angel. Balaam doesn't. That is until, quote, the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand. Uh, or similarly, maybe think of 2 Kings 6, which is Elisha being surrounded by the, the Syrian army, and the situation's not looking good, and his servant thinks that all is lost, that they have no hope, but what the servant doesn't know is what Elisha sees is that there's a, there's a whole host of angels. There's an angel army surrounding them as well. And so 2 Kings 6 tells us, Then Elisha prayed and said, O oh Lord, please open this man's eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Right? Like Balaam, the young man couldn't see the, the wondrous spiritual realities that were there until the Lord opened his eyes so that he could see. Well, friends, the same is true when it comes to the Bible. Now, you can read the words on the page. Uh, you, can, you can understand the grammar, you can, you can grasp the logic between sentences or, or understand the point of a story. At, at a surface level, you, you, can, you can grasp what's there. But unless the Lord opens your eyes to the beauty and the spiritual realities of the Word of God, it'll never seem wonderful to you. And you won't really understand why people read it all the time. And why they long for it in their lives. I mean, again, this psalmist, remember, he, he actually pants after God's word. That's how much he longs for it. God, I pant after your word. Why? Because at some point, his eyes have been opened to see the wondrous things that are there. So listen, I'm not, I'm not trying to beat anyone up here this morning, but if you never long for God's word, like if, you, if you just never long for it, if you don't really get at what Bible churches like this are so excited about and why we hammer the Bible home week after week after week. Let me tell you something amazing. Uh, about 15 guys over the past weekend gave up their Friday night and gave up their Saturday so that they could sit in a stuffy, muggy room and listen to a guy teach them about how they can better study the Bible. It was like a grammar lesson. <laughs> Diving in deep. Now, if that sounds crazy to you, if you go, why in the world would you give up a Friday night and a Saturday after a long week of work? Why would you do that to sit in a room like that to learn this? But if none of this makes sense to you, or you have to at least step back and ask the question, have my eyes ever really been opened? Is it possible that I'm, I'm actually spiritually dead? If you don't long for God's word, you have to at least, at least consider that possibility. I remember one time trying to uh, share God's word with someone who wasn't a believer. And, and I was trying to encourage this man to read the Bible. And to his credit, he, he did read some of it. He read some of John's gospel. Um, here is his honest response, though, after reading it. Uh, these are his words. He said, 
Keith, I wanted to let you know that I read all of it. It felt like it was written for little kids, simple and repetitive. Not sure how you see it, but for me, it just seems like recollections about a few followers. Apparently, Jesus said a few things, made a few claims, or pointed out to these followers that he saw them before they saw him. I honestly don't see what the big deal is. Maybe I am missing something, question mark. Don't mean to come off as being harsh, critical, or judgmental, just giving you my honest assessment of what I read. This is a very smart man. He read the words, he understood them. But he didn't see. I'm praying, God, please open his eyes. Please open his eyes to see the wondrous things that are that are there in your law. And friends, this has always been the case if people are really going to see. Uh, they need God to open their eyes. Uh, and they need so, let me just to be clear, there's not, there's, not some, there's not some sort of like hidden message in the Bible. Right? That's not what we're talking about. Uh, we're talking here, you might call it the doctrine of illumination. That if we're really going to see the, the point, if we're really going to understand, if it's really going to impact us in any way, we need God to open our eyes. Again, the veil is, is not over the Bible, it's over our eyes. So we're not talking about discovering some sort of hidden message in the Bible, but, but really understanding what God has revealed here. And again, this has always been the case if people are really going to see. God must do it. Think about when God's people were in the wilderness, and he, he'd given them his, his testimony, uh, his commands, or, or what were called the words of the covenant. But then there was this moment in the land of Moab in Deuteronomy 29, beginning at verse 2. And Moses summoned all Israel and said to them, You have seen all that the Lord did before your eyes in the land of Egypt, to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to all his land, the great trials that your eyes saw, the signs and those great wonders. But to this day, the Lord has not given you a heart to understand or eyes to see, or ears to hear. Right, in other words, you, you saw some things, but you didn't really see them. You didn't, you didn't see them for what they really were. And, and you read the words of the covenant, you heard the words of the covenant, but you didn't, you didn't really hear them for what they are. And let's listen to how the New Testament describes this failure to really see. 2 Corinthians 4, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. And so verse 18 of Psalm 119 is telling us that there are, there are wondrous things to be seen in the Bible. But it's also telling us that unless God opens our eyes, we will not see them. And, and therefore, the conclusion is we must pray for God to open our eyes so that we can see. And if you're not a Christian, listen, this is where you begin. You begin by asking God to, to open your eyes. And if you are a Christian, this is, this is where you keep praying. Uh, your ability to engage well with God's word is always dependent upon God opening your eyes. If, if you don't regularly ask God for his help, and if he doesn't open your eyes every day, you're going to miss the glory of Jesus that's all over this Bible. Uh, you're going to miss the beauty of the gospel that's on every page of this Bible. Uh, the whole Bible tells us, through all of its commands, all of its laws, all of its promises, all of its precepts, all of its judgments, this whole Bible tells us that the, that the glory of God has been supremely revealed in the face of Jesus Christ, and that Jesus has come to us to die for us so that we can be forgiven of our sin and reconciled to God for eternity. That glory and that beauty is all over this Bible. But you'll never really see it. And it'll never seem wonderful to you unless God opens your eyes. So ask him to do that. Ask him to open your eyes so that you can see, especially when you're weary. Remember, that's the context here. Especially when you're weary. Now, this psalmist knows that God's testimonies are his counselors, verse 24. He knows that it's God's word that will give him life. 
but sometimes when you're weary, you just you can't see it quite as clearly. Friends, trust that in this book are wondrous things for you to behold that God will use to strengthen you when your soul feels like it's clinging to the dust. And part of what makes this book so wonderful is the very specific way that God will apply his word to your specific situation if you have eyes to see. And so begin there. God, open my eyes. Second, uh, the psalmist prays that God would teach him his word. Verse 26, when I told of my ways, you answered me, teach me your statutes. Okay, so whenever we open the Bible, we ask God to open our eyes. But our need for God, it doesn't stop there. We need to also ask him to teach us. That's why I will very often pray, as I did today. As we come to this time of the sermon, I'll pray, and I will ask God that the Holy Spirit would be our teacher here this morning. Right? Because it's not my teaching that you need. It's the teaching of the Holy Spirit that you need. And the Holy Spirit works through this word that he's inspired. That's the teaching that you and I both need. Third, the psalmist prays that God would make him understand the Bible. Verse 27. Make me understand the way of your precepts and I will meditate on your wondrous works. So open my eyes, teach me, and give me understanding. It's just one more way the psalmist here is crying out to God for God to drive the wonderful truth of his word deep into his soul. And again, this is particularly important when we're weary. It's when we're weary that we desperately need to understand how God uses trials in our lives, right? It's then that we most need to fully understand the truth of something like Romans 8. God works all things together for the good of those who love him. And it's when we're weary that we need to most understand exactly what Jesus has done for us, that no matter what this world throws at us, because of Jesus, our names are written in heaven for eternity. God Make me understand that. So open my eyes, teach me, make me understand. And then fourth, the psalmist prays that God would both take away the scorn he's receiving, verse 22, and that God would remove from him any false ways that he may be tempted to follow. Verse 29, put false ways far from me and graciously teach me your law. So in other words, God, people are, people are sinning against me. Now please take away their sin from my life and please keep me from sinning against you. And Lord, and please do it by being gracious to me. Uh, your word is a means of grace in my life. So teach me your word that I might not sin against you. And so friends, what you have here, you see, is a, is a strategy for you when you're weary. Uh, when you're weary, don't, don't give in to the temptation to simply give up and throw in the towel. Uh, don't give in to the temptation to simply look within and try to find some sort of inner strength. Uh, don't give in to the temptation to simply pull back from the ways of God in your, in your life. Uh, don't give in and simply pull back and think, I, I have no time for anyone else. And you just go inward and you look inward. Rather, when your soul is clinging to the dust, cling even more to the word of God. I ask him to open your eyes, to teach you, to make you understand, and to keep all sin far from you. Uh, I mentioned that I'd come back to Roy's uh, story. Uh, here's how Roy's story ends as he tells it. He goes on to say, I was off work for three months. At the time, I never thought about my experience as being burnout. But I went through a period thinking, I will never get back to work. I know that it's not like this for others, but on September 16th, it was like a light switch went on, and I suddenly thought, I can go back to work now. In faith terms, I never felt that God was distant, but it troubled me deeply that I was unable to read even the Bible. He's being very honest there. I was so weary. I, I couldn't read any. I couldn't read. I couldn't even read the Bible. But then listen to what he says next. He says, This is where my evangelical heritage came to the rescue. Although I couldn't read, the Bible was not lost to me. As a young Christian, I had memorized Scripture avidly. 
I had always found this useful in evangelism and the pastoral care of others, being able to quote relevant scriptures to others. But now it came home to me in a new way. The word was hidden in my heart, feeding me and assuring me at my lowest point. By memorizing God's word, I had invested in my own soul and it was now paying dividends. God took me by surprise by how alive the word was in my heart. Have you ever been that weary? So weary that you can't even read the Bible? Well, you see, this is, this is what we talked about last week. And why we, what we talked about last week is so important, the importance of us storing up God's word in our hearts, hiding it away in our hearts, because there may come times in our lives in which the only way that we're able to cling to God's word is by calling to mind that which we have already stored up. And so as we, as we finish up the sermon here, and as you sit there this morning, listen, uh, don't leave here today without making three commitments. Okay, the, the psalmist, he makes three commitments here at the end. Don't leave here today without making these commitments. One, no matter how weary you may get, commit to choosing the right way. Verse 30, I have chosen the way of faithfulness. I set your rules before me. Two, no matter how weary you get, commit to clinging to God's word. Verse 31, I cling to your testimonies, O Lord. Let me not be put to shame. And three, no matter how weary you get, commit to running the course set before you. Verse 32, I will run in the way of your commandments when you enlarge my heart. That's actually a great image there at the end of that verse. When you enlarge my heart. Now normally, physically, an enlarged heart is not a good thing, I don't think. But spiritually, that's a great thing. We want hearts that are large. Uh, a poet has uh, reflected on these verses and she's wrote a little poem and she talks about how, how grief constricts our hearts. She talks about the grief constricted heart and that the only way to open up the valves of a grief constricted heart is by the word of God. And when the word of God comes to our grief constricted hearts and opens up those valves, you know what we can do? We can run <laughs> and we can run fast and we can run with joy ultimately. That's what the psalmist is asking for here. So friends, before you leave here today, make the commitments that the psalmist does so that when weariness hits, you will not be defeated. Commit to choosing the right way. Commit to clinging to the word of God and commit to running the course that God sets before you. And as you make those commitments, pray. Pray that God will open your eyes. Pray that he will teach you. Pray that he will make you understand. Pray that he will keep sin far from you, both the sin of others and your own sin. And pray that he will enlarge your heart. Let's pray. God, we ask that you would do these very things that we've just been talking about. Give us, Lord, open eyes. Open our eyes wide and enlarge our hearts, God. That's what we ask for here today, according to your word. We want, we want open eyes and large hearts. Please do this, Lord, as we seek to navigate this world and to, to live for your glory and to proclaim Jesus Christ. We ask this in his name. Amen.